Hi, if you don't know, I'm Rory, Dirty Smith. Uh, a little bit about me, I have 20 years of forging experience, doing architectural ironwork, working in the family business. Dirty Smith is a effort to help demonstrate some basics that are getting overlooked. And now hopefully you can learn by watching these. So we are episode 30, the big 3-0. Holy stuff. We're doing things a little differently. I'm gonna start incorporating projects. Now that we got most of the basics covered, we can start doing some fun stuff. And that was kind of the whole point, is if you were seeing something I was doing, like what is, how is he forge welding? Well, there's an episode just on forge welding. So this one is a colonial style trammel hook. I've been seeing them on Etsy and I have never made one. This is the first one I've made. So I was looking at some of the pictures and figuring out what if we did this, what if we did that. And the guys over on Patreon, one gentleman asked for a fancy hook. I was like, what, what do you mean by fancy hook? So I was like, well, let's, let's make a fancy functional hook. So how this works is you hang this bad boy up so it centers itself and then you adjust the height by these hooks. Pretty handy dandy. So in this episode, you're gonna see me mess up a little bit and how I get out of it. Instead of just like a ring or something, did a top one so this guy can, can center itself up when you have weight on it. But it feels really good. I mean, that guy's not going anywhere. So I'll stop yapping. You know what the routine is? Let's do this. <laughs> Episode 30 hooks, the magical hook. So we have small hooks to hold small things. Big hooks to hold big things. Weird hooks to hold weird things. Pretty hooks that don't need to hold anything, just look pretty if need be. Hooks that hang off of things so they can swing. J hook at a round bar. The J is this shape here. So this guy was made for a chandelier. You slipped it over the chandelier and you can hang an item off of that hook. And weird double-ended hooks. This one actually holds uh, shop rags. So you hang it on a piece of pipe. And on this side you can hold a rag and that side you can hold a rag. A raggy hook. When we're talking about hooks, we are also talking about some function that these serve a purpose. So when we're forging hooks, especially if they're holding stuff in line, we have to keep in mind the stock of the hook where the hook is. Now the hook needs to have an opening. If you close this up, that's called an eye. So it needs to have the invitation for us to bring something this opening that will hang from this. Now depending where the weight hangs, the weight hangs straight down here. It's good to keep this bar inside of that imaginary line where the item hooks. So for example, this guy, we got this big bar. If you drew imaginary line there you know it's not shallow it's not too deep it's right down the middle so when this guy hangs he pulls on the bar down evenly and he doesn't cause it to kick off one side or another same thing with this guy it was designed to keep this weight close to this wall that it hung on to so when the weight pulls on this a lot of the force is close to this for the center of gravity it's not out here and torquing anything over. This guy was a little bit different. If he's being hung from a bar there, we want that weight to be as close as possible. I could move this and kick it over a little bit more so that the weight is more in line with this. And this was actually for a demo in Vermont. This was the original hook I was gonna do and realized it's not ideal for coats because as people would come in, it would be pulling away from them or grabbing and hooking onto things. So for that application, this was not the ideal hook. So we'll be doing the adjustable tremel hook. These could be made for holding plants. These could be made for cooking over a campfire. Look at that, I even, even drew what I was gonna do. So for materials, quarter by inch and a half. I have some half inch bar for this hook, some half inch bar for this hook. We're gonna put a rivet here. So when we hang this, this guy can center itself up. These slots here are made for this bar. So this bar can slide out of this slot, move up, slide back in, 
which changes the height of this bottom part. It has to go up. I won't do these any traditional way. I'll simply drill and cut and do stock removal for these slots. And then this bottom tab here is the bottom receiver that keeps this hook in place. We'll also make sure that this hook is parallel to this system. If you design these, if you build these, you need to make sure that this arm back here stays in place somehow. If it if it gets too much weight in one side, it might pop out. And then uh, if you have a couple feet of the round bar, that's ideal. You can use your hand to hang onto it versus tongs. I, I prefer that more than tongs, but if you don't, you know, all you have are drops, you know, use the tools that you have. Be offsetting the shoulder just a little bit for here. To the very basics, we're gonna be forging a taper. Again, we are only gonna use this much of our anvil on the edge of the anvil to forge our taper. There's no reason to forge a taper here. Here's a lot more forgiving on the end. So again, I'm gonna bring my material out, stay inside of this area, and forge my taper. I'm gonna mark off two inches of material, and that's where our taper will start, and we're gonna forge this out to four inches. So our taper, taper will be four inches long from our mark here. Just give it a little nick. You can see right where that mark is. When you're forging these, don't forget, square octagon around. So right, get the tip down. And pretty much right there, I have a taper. So looking for where our nick was, which is right here. Start reducing it down, side to side. Nice, square, hits. First heat, we're at three inches. Now this we're using round bar, so I want to keep that round bar shape. So I have an inch to go. And about three and three quarters, I'm going to stop forging on the square like this. Knock the diamond down and then round it up. Probably should grow another quarter inch pretty easy. So three and a half. Again, same place. The steel is moving underneath it. I'm not doing this bull crap. Use hammers that are comfortable for you. So second heat. I am at three and three quarters. So this next one, I will knock these corners down, make it an octagon, and then start rounding it up. So we have a nice reducing taper that's still round. So knock those corners down. Pay attention to the material. And make sure that these sides, as you're knocking these corners down, that they're the same. When I was younger, I would always get impatient on this step. Craig would say, I'm making square quills. They weren't really circles, they weren't really square. So starting at the tip, light blows, we'll start rounding this up. I can see my mark, I am exactly four inches. So when you're forging these hooks, we need to keep in mind on how to forge them and how to make this shape work out, especially if you have to do consistently forge the same hook over. I find it easier to bend the tip if you have to do any decoration and then bend the shoulder here. We're gonna scroll this tip over so it's not catching on to stuff. And then we're gonna bend this shoulder over the edge of the anvil. And then real similar to the eye, now this end is done and that end's done. Start coming over to the horn if we need to, the edge of the anvil, whatever it takes to start forging this around and coming over. If you're doing a lot of these, probably would recommend using a jig. They can just pop this in and bend it and do it. But for, for you guys learning on how to forge hooks, this is really good practice and great demonstrations if you find yourself with a crowd around you watching. So again, do the tip, do the shoulder, and then bring it around. Okay, I'm gonna make sure I got my mark in place. Doesn't take much, just a little scroll. If we put the scroll in down, when we knock our shoulder over, that should look good because our scroll will be facing us like it is now. Put your mark right on the edge there. 
My heat's a little broad, that's why this is kicking up. Ways to fix that, if you could, you could quench it if you wanted to. And with hooks, I always go, and eyes, I always go a little bit further than I think. So quench the tip off and start bringing that guy around. Now this is one kind of hook. If you're making a hook that was holding weight this way and wanted a wide receiving end of it, this would be a good uh, a shape. You could stop here if you wanted. In our case, we're going to keep keep wrapping it around. Notice I'm holding my hammer pretty close to the head as I want a lot of control. If I was trying to do that with my hand way back here, I would have a hard time controlling it. You see, I'm, I'm grabbing here and bringing it over, knocking it around. It's more of a bending motion than it is a forging motion. Same thing, just on the other side. So when you're forging hooks, sight down it. Look down that middle and, and see, where, see where that bar is passing through that eye. Another thing you can do is you use your vise. So I got this guy locked up and I just want to knock this whole hook over just a little bit. Not much, but I like that. Close it up just a little bit. I like the way that line comes down. This, that should hang nicely because I want everything to pull right off of the center of that bar as it comes down. If it's off, off center, it might move the whole tremel setup off center, which we don't want. So as far as forging hooks, that's how you forge a hook. The rest of this video is about the uh, tremel. Now I want one on the bottom. That's gonna be the bottom half of this. And then I want one on the top. So I need one more hook. I want it to be a little bit bigger. So still gonna do the tip like we talked about. So nobody hurts themselves. So I want this guy. So it's gonna go down. I want that pointed down. So when that comes over right out there, So here we have a really broad, bigger hook paired to ugh, our original small hook. Those will be the top hook that's gonna pivot this guy more appropriate for things to hang off of it. If anyone's wondering, the ID of this is inch and a half. So I have an inch and a half ID radius inside there. Sighting down it, making sure everything's looking good. I like it. So three inches down is where we're gonna start the first rece receiver hole. That's where the bar's gonna go in. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, it's okay, this will all make sense. So inch and a half, three quarters. If you're finding center on bars, go from both sides. And that little gap that can mean, mean the world. See them like inch and a quarter apart. So one. And we're indexing where our holes are going to be because we're going to drill those out. Find center. So I'm going to locate center all of these and I'm going to lay out how I'm going to draw in my guidelines for the, uh, the bar. Okay, so we have center located. One, two, three, four, five, six holes. And these guys, this is a 45 degree angle here. So if I mark 45 on the center of that intersection, I can measure off either side of that for the correct thickness for our bar. Located center, drew our 45 degree marks for the thickness of the round stock. Now in the shop, you can cut on the inside of the line, you can cut on the outside of the line, you can also cut on the line, you can take the line. So in this case, I will cut a little heavy and I will take the line. That way we probably have closer to the 5 eighths of a gap instead of half inch. So next I will drill a 9 16 hole 
It's a little bit bigger than the half inch, so we have clearance when this post goes in there to receive it. You know what? I realized I forgot the receiver hole at the bottom. I did a boo-boo. So taking the greatest three, two and three quarters. So we need a hole down here. So it needs, we need to have a tab with a hole in it. This round bar has somewhere to, to rest, to sit. But I, you know, the hole, the, the hole can be bigger than the round bar. It's just really a keeper. If we take, so we got an inch and a half. So from the bottom of this hole, let's go inch and a quarter. Yeah, we're kind of just making this on the fly, which is fine. And we have inch and five eighths. Mark something close to center. And after I drill this hole, we'll do something fun. So I'm gonna drill this one probably like half inch. And then uh, show you I have plan in stock. So yeah, that's why I forgot the keeper. Let me drill that guy. I'll be using a cutoff wheel to cut these slots out. You could use a handsaw, you could use a jibsaw, use whatever you want. I have cutoff wheels, I have grinders. You know, if you do use these, uh, keep these in mind where the sparks are going. I always try to throw the sparks down, but I'll be coming right in here and removing stock. So after the cutoff, I'm going to clean these up with a file a little bit. You could punch this, you could slit and drift this. I drilled it and I'm gonna put a drift through that. And our drift is three quarters. Yeah, three quarters of an inch. So with a half inch bar in there, it's gonna be a, a decent keeper and not restrict that. So this allows the bar to pop out and move where it needs to move. There'll be enough room inside here. So there's one way to do that, drill it and then drift it. You could punch it, you can slit and drift it, but this is another way. So we're gonna get this hot over the pritchard hole, shove this drift through that guy. I wanna make sure I keep my heat localized so I don't wanna get into these teeth. So I could have drilled a hole, but I like the little gifts of the material moving from the drift. You know, show some sign of being forged. As an alternate, you could also have punched and drifted these guys and had little swells on the sides here. That would have been cool too. So the next part we gotta do is we need to bend this tab up. Now we don't wanna bend it right now because we're gonna screw up that tooth. So let's just lower it, protect all that work. And then you be the judge. Or you think is best. Again, this bottom was just a keeper. And just knock it over. It's that easy. I've been thinking about how to do this. There's a lot of different ways. I could have done this end first and then done the hook last. So anyways, this guy will go in that way. Slide all the way down. So we need to upset the material here. And then we need to bend this guy over. So I want some mass on the end of this and then we're just going to bend it 90. That way when this guy sits in here he can pop right into those notches and then we can locate our hole and put the smaller hook on top. So I'm upsetting in the vise. I want to make sure that my heat is right here. I don't need this whole thing hot. Just right there. It's going to move quickest at the hottest point. We don't need a big upset. So, kind of like a rivet head going in circles and then you can hit the middle and get the fan out. If you want to, you can use a cross clean. 
And then grabbing our bad boy. See, I like that. It won't, won't come out of there. This is the other moment of truth. Big enough to get through our keeper. Wherever you want this hook to be located, it's going to be determined by the bend that you put up here. I want to show off the hook. I want the metal work to talk. So I'm going to do, do it this way. You could also do it this way if you have a situation where you need to easily load the hook from this side. Feel free to, to customize it any way you want. But again, I like seeing the side of the, the hook, the profile, and I want to show off the ironwork. So I'm going to do a presentation of the hook this way. When you're heating in the vise too, try not to get your vise hot. Heat out here and then adjust the material where you want. So in this case, I'm gonna, I'm gonna heat right in here, bring it back, forge it over. Bring it back, make sure my hook's in a good spot. On top far back. And here I'm straightening it up a little bit if I need to. That's well, pretty, pretty straightforward. I want to forge this a little thinner. That way when our plate comes up to it, there's either a shoulder, but this is flat on the back, and the mass is thinned down and flared out. And then we can drill our holes and set our rivet. If you want it, you could come back a little bit, forge it from the other side, and then clean up again. So we got a back wall, it's nice and flat, fullered on one side. There we'll drill our hole on both pieces and we'll rivet this guy. So at the shop, we have rivets. You don't have to do a rivet. You can you can forge another hook on the end of this, and then uh, you know hook it through that. You could anything you want to do. I like rivets, so we're going to rivet this. I want this guy to be loose. I don't want it to be tight. So it's a quarter inch rivet. I drilled a 2364 hole, so it's a little sloppy. It's a little loosey goosey, and that's okay. Put everything on one side so it stays out of the way for us. Because if we had this out here and then we're trying to hit this, it could get messy. So you can put it out here, elevate it up. If you want, you could put a, a header underneath it. These are pretty, pretty soft. They don't really take much. Okay, so we're putting the finished head on the outside. We're going to put the ugly end on the back. We're going to put everything on one side for us so we can hang on to this when we set this rivet. In these little ones, you don't really need to do hot you can but you can you can set them cold you want to you want to keep it loose you don't want it too tight if it's too tight obviously people might get bound up and stuff so like that it's a little firm it's not totally loosey-goosey All right, so that's not going anywhere. Still a little engineering going on. And again, this is my first one. I've seen some pictures. It's like, I can make one of those. Uh, the keeper could have been pushed out a little bit more. But again, I can fix a lot of that on the back end here. You could, other ways you could fix this. You could fuller that whole side right there. That wouldn't be too bad. So a little tweak, then we'll be done. So after thinking about this and uh, the best way to go about this, I would really like if this always stayed parallel with that. So some things we have to keep in mind. The thickness of this cannot exceed that hole. If it does, this better be in place first because you're not going to get that in line without modifying this. We put another slot, which you could, but then runs the risk of it popping out again. So. I am going to fuller it on one side that'll make a trap. So it'll lock it in there no matter what. 
not a lot of weight's ever going to hang off of this so i'm not worried about this ever bending here or bending up there if people are hanging dead bodies off of this that's they got other problems we have the equipment to just simply mark it where i wanted so i'm gonna put some center punch marks in this guy i would like to do the the round bar put it on top and forge it down or even put it on top of something and then forge it down that way we have a little bit of lip. It's a little bit bigger than it needs to be, so there's a little bit of play. So I have my impromptu bottom fuller. A located center. I think it's gonna work. Let's try it. So line it up. We don't need much. Just enough. I'm a little worried about it flaring out and not fitting in our recesses. We got a little tooth there. Ooh, we got a little bit more. I think we're on the right track. So I'm pushing it down when I'm hitting it too. All right, so I like where we had to fix that and clean up the sides a little bit with a file. You know, and if you have to improvise and work your way through it, that's okay. Uh, I kind of like the look, the aesthetic of the upside end, so I'm going to leave it. So we fullered one side of this guy, clean it up with the vise, and then see how it works. Oh yeah, that's not going anywhere. That locks in real nice. I heated it up a little bit because we had some shinies from where... We did the stock removal. So you just need a little orange, nothing serious. You can use a wire wheel by hand, wire brush, wire wheel, and a grinder. Just go over it. So as far as finishes go, this is about as easy as you can get. We got Johnson's Paste Wax. This guy's a little, a little warm. It's not burning hot, it's just uncomfortably warm. And you just simply rub it on. Now, if I was going to make this, well, let's say it was for outside, I would expect this to rust. There's points on it that are going to be rubbing, that are going to be wearing the paint off. Whatever finish you do, if you, even if you do powder coat, there's a good chance that every time it touches that and scratches inside there, scratches on the post, <clears throat> the moisture is going to get in there. The metal is going to oxidize and thus we have rust. Something like this, the wax, I would probably suggest doing because you can maintain. If you do something with a heavy paint and you need to maintain it, you're going to have to remove paint. and That means you're going to have to get aggressive with it. This, you can just wipe it down every so often with some wax, rub off the rust, and over time, this will get a beautiful just aged patina going on just from it being steel and the weather working on it. It only takes a couple of minutes. This one isn't hot at all. And just rub it in there. Maybe let it sit for, let this guy sit for a little bit longer because he's still warm. But you can let it sit for 20 minutes until it's dry and then, and then go over it with a clean rag and get the rest of the stuff off. But this uh, Johnson's Paste Wax is probably the easiest finish you can do, especially if you're doing like a show and you got a bunch of small stuff you're trying to sell. It's fast, it's cheap, it's durable. Anybody can buy it, anybody can maintain it. They don't have to hire a special guy if they need to. It's a good selling point because your people who are gonna buy from you wanna be able to use it and maintain it as well, as easy as possible. So thank you everybody for the support. Check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, DirtySmith.com. Now I'm on Patreon. If you want to be part of Dirty Smith, you can help donate. There's packages if you donate. And also help choose the next Forging Fridays video. I will be doing at least one video a month. But again, thank you guys for the support. And until next time, keep it dirty. Oh, it's so good. Mmm.
Mm-mm-mm.